So we have several ways we try to evaluate how well our evaporators are exchanging heat. And with split systems, a lot of times we're looking at temperature difference from return to outlet or output. We've got several methods depending on the technician and just which one you want to pick and use. Uh, I know that that inlet outlet is pretty effective. Also comparing your return to say your saturation, that's another decent one. That kind of tells you how much load you might have or just return air in general. But another very effective one that we really use in the chiller side is our approach value. Hi, how you doing? I am Holden Schamberger. I'm with HVAC Time and Chiller Academy. I specialize in chillers. We're here to talk about that today. Let's get going. So your evaporator approach is a direct measure of how well you're transferring heat. Now with a chiller, what defines a chiller is we have a hydronic evaporator. It means we are processing some kind of fluid or mostly water, maybe a glycol mixture, whatever. So while using some of these other like TD type values where we're taking our entering water and our leaving water, we're taking the difference between there, that is still useful. Most chillers typically run a 10 to 12 degree, I guess technically eight to 12, depending on the design, 10 being the, the median temperature for your TD across the barrel. Now, what is far more, I would say, important for us to pay attention to is your approach value. So the approach value is your leaving water temperature, subtract your, your evaporator saturation from that. And the difference between those two temperatures gives you an approach value. And the higher the approach value, the less heat transfer is happening or the less efficient that transfer is happening. The lower that value, the more efficient. And this is something I think even with a regular split system or an RTU would be extremely effective for troubleshooting your heat transfer. Uh, it, so how you would do that is very similarly. You would take your leaving air to your evaporator saturation. The difference between there gives you an evaporator approach. Now, something like a split or an RTU might run a 10 to 15 degree approach with a shell and tube, meaning we have this big cylinder with a bunch of tubes running through it, we're gonna typically run a three degree, degree approach on the top end, and it, ideally it might be lower than that. So under fairly normal operating conditions, everything's on point, it may run half a degree to two degrees and, and be perfectly fine. That would actually be fairly normal and a very good number for a flooded style shell and tube. Now. There's other styles that are also out there we have to take into account. Flooded are very efficient. Flooded and falling film, either way you slice that, they're very efficient for heat transfer. So with a flooded evaporator, our refrigerant's going to be on the outside of the tubes and our water on the inside. And it's a pretty efficient process. But the other style is a DX evaporator. So we still have the shell and tube design, but our mediums switch, meaning our water is now on the outside of the tubes, it's on the shell side, and our refrigerant is on the inside of the tubes. That is a less efficient but still very effective way. You see this very commonly on, say, a lot of air cools. While it happens, it's pretty rare to see one on, say, more of a water cool design as those are typically built for, for better efficiency. Either way, a DX style evaporator should run a say eight to ten degree approach and this is also true for a a tube and tube and a brace plate heat exchanger as well all three of those designs are going to run a eight to ten on the top end before you start having to really get worried about it now this they will also run much lower than that if everything's okay by so by lower than that four to six degrees would be phenomenal for those like that that would be a pretty typical operating range and then as there was issues happening that's going to scale your that temperature up so some things that are going to influence that value are your if you have a lot of oil in your evaporator let's say we're not managing the oil system very well that oil's getting in there and it's acting as an insulator we're not transferring heat very well because of the oil uh, let's say we have a really high eGPM through the evaporator, higher than it's designed for. That high GPM will create a, or can create a laminar type condition where we're not properly creating turbulence in our water the way we need to. 
which is not going to allow proper heat transfer. You could also have actual debris or some kind of scaling happening, especially if you've got a loop that's not been treated very well for a long time. Maybe it's very ionized or it's got a lot of rust in it. Uh, I've had some, you open a valve and it's just a liquid form of rust pouring out of it. In those conditions, that water is not going to transfer heat very well at all. So that's going to drive up your approach value because it can't just pass it back and forth properly. Because again, approach is a measure of heat transfer. It is an ability to see how well we are passing heat from one to the other. I do want to clarify this one thing. If you think if you're having an approach issue where your approach is really high, I'm not too worried about it being low. But if your approach is really high, it's not going to be a low flow, okay? Low flow is going to lower your approach value as a whole because your water to refrigerant contact time, not literal contact, but their time spent processing across each other is going to slow down because the water is being slowed down. We're reducing our GPM. And in that process our approach is going to be forced to get lower even though that our that gpm may get so low that we can't sustain the evaporator so i just i want to put that out there really quickly that don't let yourself get caught up in that if you are dealing with higher approach and you think it's a flow issue at most it's going to be a high flow issue if you don't have a high gpm through that barrel which a dp might help you determine that then you're you're going to have some kind of actual heat exchanging issue that's not related to flow whether it be the oil scaling maybe there's some trash in the system something along those lines quick recap you're leaving water subtract your evaporator saturation from that the difference between those gives you an approach value then you have to just compare that to whatever style of heat exchanger that you have I'll do another video at some point on the actual differences between the heat exchangers and go a little more in depth on their design operations, what we do with them, blah, blah, blah. If this video has been really helpful for you, please go check out Chiller Academy. I've got some self-paced interactive online courses over there that you can go watch. I have a course where I bring you up from the ground up and where you can learn chiller systems. I've also got a centrifugal course on a YK over there. You can go check out with that MTT. Make the time for your family, for your spouse, for your kids. They really need you.